As everyone settles in, we have a fantastic panel to discuss um, economic issues associated with the oil and gas industry, both currently and looking forward. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Jeff Holmstead. I am very proud to say Jeff is not only a friend, but a board member of our energy policy, a partner at Bracewell, a former deputy administrator at the Environmental Protection Agency under President George W. Bush. Uh, and um, he is one of the leading legal um, and regulatory experts in the energy and environmental field, and a pleasure to work with, I can say, from OEP's standpoint. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Jeff to introduce our panel. Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, I've been looking forward to this evening for a while and to hearing from our distinguished group here. Uh, as I was looking at their bios, one of the things that I'm envious about for all of you who work in the oil and gas sector is, I spent my whole life working in Washington, D.C., and I think uh, everybody up here has worked in multiple countries and probably most of you as well. So I think you bring a, maybe a, a little bit different perspective from those of us who spent our whole career in Washington, D.C. Anyway, I'm gonna quickly introduce our three panelists, uh, and I'm gonna do it on my phone because I didn't, my flight didn't get here in time to print out what I had, uh, what I had written, so please forgive me as I'm looking at my phone. Uh, first, on my far right is Auda Cuellar, who is Vice President of Energy Transition at Shell USA. Um, she, in this position, is responsible for implementing all of Shell's US energy transition strategy. Uh, I'm not going to go over the list of positions she's had. You'll have to trust me that it's been a number of them at Shell, including senior roles in operating and manufacturing assets and positions where she has been engaged with, with uh, external partners and customers. She lived and worked in Europe, Africa, Asia, North and South America, so she does have a real appreciation of, uh, of the perspective that other countries bring to climate change and other issues. She holds a bachelor's degree in environmental and engineering, in engineering, an MBA, and has also recently finished an executive general management studies at INSED. I've seen that written many times, I've never said it, so I hope I said that right. Uh, Dean Foreman, who's on my immediate right, is the chief economist at the American Petroleum Institute. And uh, for those of us in DC, we know him as an expert in the economics and markets for oil, natural gas, and power. We're delighted to have him here. Um, before joining API, he had positions involving forecasting and market analysis, uh, strategic planning, risk management with a number of energy companies, including ExxonMobil, Talisman Energy, Sasol, and Saudi, uh, Saudi Aramco. He holds a PhD, a PhD in economics from the University of Florida. And then on my, on my left is the guy who's gonna finance the energy transition. Uh, Ben Exner is a director on Citi's Global Energy Investment Banking Team. Uh, he provides strategic and financial advice to clients in the energy sector with a focus on, on midstream and oil services. Uh, before joining Citi, he worked for Marathon Oil for over 10 years, where he served in strategic finance and operational roles in Houston, Scotland, and Norway. Uh, he's not shy to tell you he's a proud native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, received his bachelor's degree from LSU and an MBA from, from Rice. Uh, as we were putting together the panel, we thought it probably make the most sense to invite each of the, the panelists just to take five minutes to sort of share their perspective on the road that lies ahead for oil and gas. And uh, I guess, Auda, we'll start with you. Oh, am I on? Oh yeah, here I am. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, thank you for having me. Um, may, maybe I'd like to start off by, by tying into your comment about having a, uh, an international perspective. I did, in fact, have the opportunity to live in many places uh, around the world. And I bring that up because I believe that that gives me very grounded on the need for have different solutions that apply across all different parts of the world to continue to provide the energy that the world needs today and in the future in a social responsible manner. Um, one more piece uh, about me before I share a bit more about Shell and, and my role and what we're doing uh, on keeping grounded. I never lose my opportunity when I have an opportunity to speak to, to talk about my, my little guys. Um, so we will, Shell is very committed to achieve net zero by 2050. 
um, and, and that just seems like so far away, but I always have to think of my, my little men. My little guys, by, the, by 2050, they're just gonna be in their 30s. Now, they think that's very old. Two things about that. They know that by that time, it's way too early for, be, for me to be a grandmother. And second, I think that it keeps me grounded because I certainly want for them to have and to live in a world that leaves, is at least as good as what we have today. So I'll just show that in terms of grounding of, of what keeps me connected to, to this topic and, and the energy we need today and in the future. Um, a bit about Shell as, as we uh, engage in this conversation. Um, Shell, as an integrated company, energy company, is committed to achieve net zero by 2050, addressing scope one, two, and three. I appreciate your, your question uh, earlier before. And what we are about is providing more and cleaner energy for the world. More energy does not mean that that means more emissions. It absolutely means being able to capture emissions and address the climate uh, impact that, that emission cause. Um, we are uh, uh, operatable across different 80 countries plus and are really committed to continue to evolve in all the energy sectors uh, where we operate, which is very broad. It is certainly in oil production and gas. Oil production having reached our peak already in 2017 and very much estimating that our oil, oil production will go down. Continue to be in gas and find ways to produce that to, pro to provide energy in a responsible way, but equally engage on power and in certainly all the elements of renewables, um, renewable uh, power, solar as well as wind, air, renewable fuels, um, chemicals in a sustainable way, renewable natural gas. Um, I would say what I'm very much committed and what I know we're gonna speak about today is that the how, the how we continue to grow our business is really important. Two pieces to close my intro. For Shell, it is very important that we continue, we are committed to have a profitable our business, and it is a for profit business, and I believe, and Shell believes, that being able to contribute to society involves continuing to create jobs and an opportunity for, sorry, this will keep going on and off, an opportunity for, um, for economies to continue to thrive. Second piece to, to close it off is the element around bringing everybody forward the element about bringing social justice, about bringing environmental justice in how we operate in different parts of the world, but very relevant specifically to the United States, which is where we're here today, are essential on the how we approach um, our transition and continue to provide the energy the world needs. Great. Did I do my job with my... You, you, you did. You <laughs> said... I warned everybody within five minutes, so you, you came in well under that. Thank you. <laughs> But Dean, that doesn't mean you get extra time. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully my mic's on and you all, even in the back, can hear me. I'm a little bit hoarse today. So you probably know the American Petroleum Institute is an advocacy organization, the largest for the industry. You may know us as the monogram that shows up on a bottle of motor oil, having set standards for 100 years. A lot of people don't realize that along with the U.S. Energy Information Administration, we're also a primary data source surveying some 90% of the industry each week. And my team puts those data in context. We put out a monthly statistical report, the one came out on Friday, the latest two months ahead of EIA, the best possible data you can use in corporate planning. Additionally, we put this into a quarterly management level outlook covering the US and global economies, oil markets and natural gas markets. And for close to two years now, we've been ahead of the curve in talking about how demand was likely to come back along with the economy. And there are always uncertainties around the economy, but real time we could observe the fuel switching that was going on. For a year and a half, we've been talking about the dearth of investment across the industry and how supply was lagging and not able to respond as quickly as demand. Workforce, supply chain, financial issues, energy policy headwinds on top of it. Fast forward to today, after Russia, Ukraine, what we've experienced in the last year. The headlines of the day really concern what's happening with the macro economy, the speed and the magnitude to which the US has led interest rate increases, strengthening the US dollar, weakening oil prices coincidentally with it. The headwinds that now with this, Financial markets have basically priced in a recession. In my view, the biggest downdraft on oil prices since last July has been the interest rate increases. Pricing in a recession, risk on, risk off. But today, 
And, and we build this up, 200 countries around the world individually. When I look at it in November, I get one view, 2.5% growth for the world for, for 2023. You get to December, there's a lot of group think. Everybody factors in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund's updates, and suddenly it looks like less than 2% growth. That's a big difference. In terms of oil demand, that's several hundred thousand barrels per day different. So net-net, the official outlooks today, EIA, Energy Information Administration, growth this year of one million barrels per day. IEA, International Energy Agency, almost two million barrels per day. Why did they disagree to such a magnitude? Part of it is economic expectations. Part of it is how the rapidity and strength with which China could come back later this year. And the third part, sitting in Europe, is factoring in a shortage of natural gas globally that we talked about earlier that could continue to stimulate the use of distillates in particular to generate power around the world. But even in these weak cases with diminished expectations, one to two million barrels per day of growth, now where will that supply come from? In the weaker one's view, let's take EIA, almost two and a half million barrels per day growth this year must come from the United States and other non-OPEC nations, excluding Russia. A million barrels per day out of the US. Our primary data show US production has flatlined. It's very difficult to break out from 12 million barrels per day. The drilling is up, but yet in EIA's estimations, the productivity is down. Rig productivity 20% year on year across the oil patch. Cost escalation is up. So yes, the industry is spending more, some $58 billion industry-wide, global companies, US listed companies, 58 billion in the third quarter last year, the last for which we had complete financial reporting. But that compares with a pace of over 70 billion a quarter in 2019 and close to 100 billion a quarter in 2015. It's not enough. So the IEA, among others, has come out in recent months and said it's not enough to meet demand this year. Now we have OPEC reductions, 2 million barrel per day cut effective November. Russian sanctions hitting crude oil in December, refined products starting next month. Some consultants say that takes another 1.5% of of liquids off the market globally. And again, we come back now, what's the cushion? How did we, if we've been talking about supply exceeding demand, how have we held it together? Why do we only have basically $90 Brent crude oil right now? Releases of strategic petroleum reserves. A million barrels per day out of the US over the last six months, unprecedented. Another three to, three to 400,000 barrels per day by other IEA member nations around the world. We know it's evident for natural gas that we've had a shortage globally. It's been masked for oil, but yet here we are. In the EIA's view, 10 consecutive quarters of US drawdowns of inventories magically shift to a surplus starting this quarter. Yet I told you crude oil production has flatlined. Where's it gonna come from? We now have the lowest strategic petroleum reserves in almost 40 years, the lowest, lowest since 1983, at a time that our consumption compared with 1983 is one third higher. These are serious policy challenges. You can't talk it down, you can't wish it away, you have to recognize what's happening with productivity in the field. These, if we're gonna have a sustainable path to decarbonization, my premise as an economist and my bias as an economist is that consumers have to have an affordable path to get there. And being serious about these in an environment when we have geopolitical uncertainties that are huge really takes a cushion for markets. So these are the challenges as we head into this year. There is a side by side, one last point I will make between natural gas in the US and oil. Natural gas was in a position in September where people thought we were short, the prices were in the US hitting as high as $10 per, per million BTU. The exports were a record and getting blamed for raising prices domestically. But within six weeks to two months, it zoomed back, drilling now 20% above pre-pandemic levels, record production, record extraction of natural gas liquids. Yet natural gas faces all the same policy, headwind, workforce, and supply chain concerns. Why isn't oil able to do it? Well, for gas, it's just Louisiana and Texas that have led it. Favorable states, good business climates, great infrastructure, good proximity, hitting on all cylinders. 
not Appalachia, by the way, which a lot of consultant models would say should economically be the greatest source of growth. But today, the Haynesville, East Texas, Louisiana, Permian Basin hitting on all cylinders. For oil, it takes a proverbial village. So you go across from the Permian, across the state line to New Mexico, you're below pre-pandemic pre levels in terms of drilling. Colorado, literally taking a powder. Wyoming, North Dakota. Issues like the moratorium on new leases on federal lands affect three of those four states substantially. State regulations, federal regulations, a sandwich of this. So if we want to have a true ground up view of what the shale revolution can be, what the potential is, it takes cogent energy policy through the entire value chain. It takes infrastructure, it takes trade. We cannot make international commitments without creating a boiling frog syndrome for American consumers unless we support production through the value chain. Low carbon barrels out of the Gulf of Mexico, leasing in the Gulf of Mexico, onshore cogent policies. With that, I'll leave it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Dean um, for two things. One, for being a great advocate for our industry. Uh, number two, when we get to Q&A and somebody asks us what the crude price is going to be, I don't want to be the one to answer, so <laughs> be ready for that one. Uh, it's obviously been an interesting few years for everybody in this room, uh, working at a large bank, having formerly been at a large oil and gas company. Uh, it, it's an interesting vantage point to see the evolution. Uh, one, one thing that I think is becoming more apparent probably most people in this room already know is more apparent to people worldwide is that this idea that the energy transition is going to happen, happen quickly and easily, uh, a lot of people are realizing that that's not the case. Uh, if I think back a couple of years, we were all sitting in quarantine when the drumbeat of starving oil and gas of capital and reallocating assets um, was really hitting hard. There are even people at senior levels of our bank that thought that our traditional clients were going away. Uh, and I think we knew, or we were certainly had a, a great appreciation that it's the traditional oil and gas companies that have all of the core competencies and resources that are needed to do much of what's needed in clean energy, whether that's engineering, construction, financing, commercial. There, there are not going to be multi-billion dollar enterprises popping up in Silicon Valley that can do all of these things, even though that may be where some of the technological evolution comes from. Uh, so I think people are, are kind of getting clued into that. Uh, and we're not in an entirely different position than you hear BlackRock, for example, these global asset managers trying to figure out what role they play in the transition. Uh, we obviously are involved in every sector in one way or another, but one of the things that our senior leaders um, were trying to figure out, uh, well, I guess first of all, when, when uh, Jane Frazier, our new CEO, got put in her position a couple years ago, one of the first things she did was commit to a 30% reduction by 2030, not zero 2050. Uh, as we kind of understand more of what that looks like, it's become more and more apparent to everyone that not only are our existing clients, but our Houston oil and gas energy team is critical to our ability to achieve those objectives and to be able to um, finance and bank the, the next evolution of companies. And what we've done organizationally is we've added a lot of resources for some of these new technologies. We have a clean energy team worldwide right now that's uh, 55 people and growing. Uh, a lot of those people have traditional oil and gas backgrounds or power backgrounds. A lot of them come from different sectors and have different expertise. Uh, so we're, we're, we're changing our organization to be able to cover a changing landscape of companies. Um, but, but we're also, again, um, spending a lot of time with our traditional clients on clean energy topics, Shell, BP, SLB, other, other names in this room, for which that's a priority. And, and one really interesting thing is if you think about the makeup of your kind of generic energy company, large capital intensive, worldwide scope. And if you also think about a new technology company, it's an entirely different type of organization. And what we're seeing on the clean energy side is kind of a nexus between the two. I was just talking about some of the acquisitions that have happened in the space. You've seen BP, Shell, Chevron make acquisitions of clean energy. Um, so so a, a fascinating dynamic there where you're combining the, call it Silicon Valley venture type organizations with these 100, 150 year old companies and, and, and everybody working together to try, to try to get to an answer. So, you know, I've, I've been in energy for 20 years. Uh, I, I've always known that oil and gas isn't going away anytime soon. 
uh, all of the new energy ventures and clean energy opportunities are just one of the many things that make this a fascinating uh, industry. And apart from living all over the world, you can just sit here in Houston your entire career and just be fascinated about what energy does and the role that Houston plays. And I look forward to the next 20 years. Well, thank you all. We, we have a lot to talk about and only about 20 minutes to talk about it. I, I, I wanted to come back to you first and just say, obviously, you want to have a, a profitable energy transition. H how, do you, how do you do that in a world where, at least as I understand it, the oil and gas business is still fairly profitable, but, but the uh, energy transition b businesses at least have, have not typically been. And if you don't have a carbon price to actually sort of price CO2 into it, and it doesn't look like we're going to have a, a, a carbon price anytime soon, how, how do you achieve a profitable energy transition? Yeah, really a good question, and, um, and I wish I would know the, the master answer for that. Um, but I can tell you what Shell is doing, um, and it obviously depends on which part of our business, right? So what does it take to be profitable in chemicals? What does it take to be profitable in hydrogen? What does it take? They all look a little bit different. Um, but I do think that there's a couple of common um, trends that are important. Um, let me start with the importance of technology and being able to uh, scale up new technologies and empower innovation in order to reduce cost. Reducing cost means to be more competitive. And that is examples like what we're doing in green hydrogen, right? Right now, Shell, perhaps some of you are aware, Shell um, has the largest um, green hydrogen plant in the Netherlands. It's being built as we speak. Um, and being able to uh, scale up the technologies at that level allows to create a new economy, and that is essential. Um, a second piece of, so I would say three pieces over. One is accelerating technologies. Um, a second piece, I do believe, is being able um, to, I spoke about a scope one, a scope two, and a scope three, is being able to incentivize not just the supply of the new energies, but being able to figure out how to mo create the demand with the market. And that is why working with consumers is essential. So part of Shell's strategy, part of our power in progress strategy, is really working with our customers. When people say, you know, how is it that you address scope three? It is our business, it is our challenge, our, quite frankly, very big business opportunity to be able to help decarbonize Penske as a practical exa example. So Penske, let me just back up, I'm from Colombia, very proud, and I love coffee, and I love Starbucks. I went to study <laughs> in Seattle. So in case you like coffee and like Starbucks, Every single uh, product, cup, whatever you, I mean, you may, from Starbucks is brought by a truck, normally, from Penske. Penske is a leading company putting out there sustainable ways for, this, for, you know, the, for their entire supply chain. Shell is a very proud partner of working with Penske for providing all of you. So are we the business with Starbucks. So being able to connect the entire supply chain to enable business that will allow us to make a transition that includes touching consumers is my second bit. And the last one, to keep it short, is actually you alluded to it, the importance of policy. I think it is incredibly important for our industry to continue to uh, advocate, actively advocate on key policies that can change the economy, such as carbon pricing. Do it different ways. But there are absolutely some levers out there that can make this faster. That's three of them. I'm sure there's many more. No, thank you. Thank you. Very, we're obviously not going to solve the problem tonight, but very interesting to know. Uh, Dean, uh, so uh, in my career, I, I deal with environmental groups a lot, and there is this insistence that you know we have to stop producing oil and gas. We, the time has come, we've got to restrict, and you live in that world too. And yet, as I understand it, we're expecting probably to have greater demand for oil and gas this year than last year, and even more after that. In, in a world where there's pressure on investors not to finance <laughs> this kind of, you know, th these sorts of long-term investments, h how do we make sure that there's the money that needs to be there to, 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 to keep the world um, with the oil and gas resources, while at the same time looking forward to the future. There's sort of this short-term need that everybody recognizes why the long-term imperative seems to be, well, we need to get away from oil and gas. So how do you finance those competing priorities? It's a fantastic question, and it's one of the pivotal issues of our time. Uh, it, 
on one hand, we're talking about a limited pie of investment that goes into all energy, not just oil and gas. And what we observe, even in the Middle East, is that that pie is being diversified over low carbon sources, renewable sources, as well as oil and gas. And it, we need an all of the above strategy. Prices ultimately are the signal that will bring more investment, but it's hard if you were trying to tell a story based on financial metrics over the last five or seven years, you know, how do you disentangle the effect of ESG from poor financial performance broadly across the sector over that period? It's really hard and it's n there's no question that some investment sources, multilateral bank, uh, development banks aren't investing in liquids projects, coal projects, you know, fossil sources are under pressure, natural gas, as we talked about, plays a complementary role with renewables, so that's been given a pass more in, in this arena. But it is hard because there's reticence by investors. There are investors that would like something that they think is the growth for the long term, but don't want to have to watch to see when do I need to pull it out. And, and it's a challenge. So I, I wish I had a concise answer of exactly how to manage it, but transparency, information, reporting, doing it right, Technology ultimately will be the answer to a lot of this. So as firms are recognized and the way forward is recognized in terms of firms that are doing it right, finding a way to manage a transition and look forward, I think that'll be rewarded by investors. But again, we have to get past this disentangling of the different sources of weak investment up to this point. Okay. And so it, Citibank, City, I'm sorry, um, obviously faces some of the same sorts of pressures from, from activist groups, from, from shareholders. How do you operate in a world where there's all this pressure to, to, to stop or to restrict financing of, especially of oil and, and, and coal? Is that something that, that, that you're sort of aware of on a day-to-day -day basis? Or does that mean, how does that affect your investment decisions? It's definitely an issue. And, um, you know, it, it's, also, it's also a PR issue. It, it, a city comes out and makes some net zero comments. We go talk to our traditional oil and gas clients, and we're not getting up there uh, like Jamie Dimon and uh, making congressmen look, look foolish, uh, even, though they, even though we're active in advocating for industry. Um, so sometimes we're on the defensive of being a little too progressive in, 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 some, of these, in some of these larger goals. Uh, our, 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 our biggest, you know, it's, it's an analog to think about investors. Our biggest exposure is kind of going to be on the lending side as far as putting our balance sheet into it. Uh, we're, we're still, uh, I think last year, we we're still number one and number two in lending to the oil and gas industry. Uh, but certainly over the long term, there's an expectation that more and more of those lending dollars will go to the clean energy industry. Uh, but it's a similar challenge to which Shell and BP and, and SLB and, and everybody else will face in that the traditional oil and gas economics are pretty good and the economics on these clean energy opportunities are in most cases uncertain. And even with the support of a well-written provision in the IRA, you know, this stuff sunsets. And you also have people that don't want to underwrite economics that are just based on government incentives. So uh, it's hard because us as a bank, we want to make money, we want to make loans that get paid back. Uh, most of the clean energy opportunities out there are not going to meet our underwriting standards, just like they're not going to meet the investment standards of a lot of public equity investors, infrastructure invest investors. So there's a huge mismatch between trillions of dollars of capital that says it wants to be invested in the clean energy and trillions of dollars of opportunities that don't meet the same parameters of what the investors want to see. W one more question just for everybody. And then uh, we, we, we do need to open it up to questions from the, from the audience. Um, if, if you could choose one public policy reform um, that would that would make a difference in the U.S. in terms of, s of, of, ad of addressing sort of this collect, uh, this group of issues that we talked about, the need to decarbonize over the longer term while at the same time making sure that we have affordable, reliable energy in the near term. Is there a public policy reform or change that you would, uh, that you would identify? I keep coming to you first, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue my pattern here. What, what, what would it be? I love the input on the spot, no issues. <laughs> um, I don't know how the what it would be, and it has to do with I spoke about the transition and every making sure that everybody's moving forward with the transition. And it is around environmental justice. It is incredibly important that our policies as we develop 
that we are very mindful that places that flood today are normally neighborhoods of people who have been um, normally not well off financially, and that one flood can, can lead to a complete, um, complete poverty. Um, I think being able to ensure that um, electric cars are not available just to those who can afford Teslas is important. So being able to really focus on how to do the transition, providing the very much essential energy that is needed today and in the future, making sure that that element of environmental justice is taken care of is the one that I would say is at the absolute top. Okay. Dean, what's your answer? In a word or two words, carbon pricing. We have to have some more transparent ability to see what the costs and benefits are to making these trade-offs, to get cost-effective solutions. A corollary to that is some sort of international emissions trading, whether it's the Red Plus uh, framework the United Nations is developing or something else, but verifiable so that as opposed to trying to decarbonize every single activity, that we end up finding least cost solutions in a global, malleable way so that markets and market incentives can really be in action to help solve the problems. Well, you know, I think we could design the right policy, but then getting it adopted on, on a worldwide basis, that might be a bit more of a challenge than coming up with the right one. E extremely, but if the market starts to work and the incentives for success are there, more will join, and you have to pro provide incentives to join. And we're seeing the beginnings of this with, you know, Europe is going to start to impose carbon the border adjustments, adjustments yeah. right? Yeah. And this is going to affect energy intensive materials. I think in this year, in the wake of Russia, Ukraine, but also these things, we're going to have some serious conversations about the food energy value chain and potential food shortages for emerging markets. And a lot of the equity issues that come out because of the productivity of food production globally having been enhanced by the energy production that we have, yeah, yeah. This, this is going to come to a head sooner in that context, I think, from a global perspective to try to figure it out. All right. Ben. I, I'd go back to the trilemma. Um, I, I like it because it, it, it is a simple, um, simple way to think about it, but it doesn't oversimplify in saying it's just one issue we're trying to solve. Uh, we think about reliability and affordability. There's, there's not an alternative currently to fossil fuels that, that gives people worldwide affordable energy and reliable energy. Um, so, so the idea of doing, doing more of all of the above with, with the resources that we have, uh, I, I think checks two of those boxes pretty well. And then like what's, what's the best thing for, for the sustainability piece of it? It's exactly what Dean just said. You, you, you have to put firm incentives in place or, or disincentives that get people to do what the public policy wants them to do. Carbon price was a very straightforward way to do that. But, but uh, you know, if it's all these secondary incentives and supports, or hoping that people do this out of the goodness of their heart. That's not a very, I mean, the most memorable part of that John Hoffmeister uh, video to me was in here sitting there talking about supply and demand. And, and so what, what, are the, what are the things we can do to get more energy to get the price down? And it's the same thing with emissions. What are the things we can do to get emissions down? You set price incentives. Right. Keep it simple. Okay. All right, well, thank you all. I, I, I have many more questions, but I'm going to stop and because we, we did want to save a few minutes for questions from the audience. So please, we turn the time over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, great and thought-provoking panel. Uh, as a follow-up to the last question, I'm surprised nobody mentioned the permitting reform. As we're talking about scaling up energy transition, as well as providing abundant and affordable energy to the world today, this should be one of the, um, one of the most important um, policies that we need to address very near term. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yeah, tough question. He says pick one, eh? <laughs> Absolutely. I think specifically to this country, we cannot make progress on any of them above if we cannot execute faster. In order to execute faster, in order to really strengthen the grid, in order to build CCS, in order to build hydrogen at a scale, wherever it may be, in order to continue to produce gas and oil at the speed that is required to meet the energy required today and in the future, we need permits. So I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's, it's absolutely at the top of the list. I don't know if it's the top one, but it's essential. 
Uh, I'll add, it's essential from a U.S. perspective in particular, but I was in Tokyo a couple of months ago for an international association of energy economics um, conference, and at the opening dinner around the table, people from Europe, the Middle East, Australia, Japan, everyone bemoaned the fact that whether we're talking about oil and gas or clean energy, the fact that you have the inability to build and expand infrastructure, that these the limits on being able to put in high voltage lines into communities, for example, that even the transition itself in the absence of permitting reform is hindered. But yet the next day, and, and there was a call for needing fossil fuels for a longer term to balance electricity grids for resilience, for reliability. On the next day, all of that went out the window and the only thing was the normal message and the mantra of all we need is more clean energy. So it is permitting reform, but it's grounding it in cogent thoughts of how this system is going to work together to actually get where we want it to go. And I think being grounding the truth and getting past the politics of it is really hard. But you would think in the wake of Russia, Ukraine, that you get divergent interests working together, pulling together, and, and often that kind of stress pulls people together on common ground. We haven't seen it yet in the energy sector. There's more talk about energy security, but not yet the consensus of how we move forward on this basis. And I don't know what it's going to take, if it's a crisis that takes it, but that's where we need to get. Excellent question. Other questions? Hi, this is a loaded question. What's it going to take to depoliticize energy in this country? Yeah. You didn't answer the last one. We'll let you answer this one. <laughs> yeah, energy is hard enough to understand if you spent a career in it. Spent a career in it. Uh, you know, what, what's it going to take to depoliticize all of our public discourse? Uh, I, I do think Ukraine, Ukraine was a positive in that it shined a light on some of the energy security issues. Uh, a lot of people expected, obviously, the European winter to be worse. Nobody would want that to happen, but if it had been worse, that would have shined some more light on that. So unfortunately, you talk about what's going to bring people together, I think sometimes it's crisis, I think sometimes it's really bad things. And, and uh, I, I think the hope would be we're able to observe these small bad things happening and make corrections before they become large bad things. But I, I'm not sure how optimistic I am that we will. I, I think from my perspective, especially over the last year and looking at the way things have played out, is there have been real things that from an economic or energy market perspective seem clear, but then our ability to advocate for what would seem to be common sense solutions has often been held back by policymakers' misunderstandings of exactly how these things work, whether it's how prices get set, what infrastructure is needed, what waivers are needed to move product from one place to another, but it, I mean, through the entire value chain. So as I'm, you know, I've expanded my team at API, we're gonna emphasize education. We're gonna focus on trying to develop materials that help really describe the way the world is working here. And could it work differently? Maybe, but at least if we start with the common ground of trying to increase that understanding, that helps bring the political rhetoric more together in terms of, you know, off a common ground set of facts to at least work from as a point of departure at a time when, frankly, there's not a lot of room for error. It's a loaded question. You know, my glass is always halfway full, so I'm just going to go on the positive side. Uh, in my role, uh, and shall be in global, I have to onboard many of our international leaders. And it always is a um, surprise, I would say, but the speed at which states or I would say different speed at which states move here in this country. And I think there's something in there about being able to, actually, yes, we're a very big country, but we have, we can go smaller and nimble and being able to move some things faster. So certainly not, not a full answer, but I think that continue to, to make things, you know, invest the, the energy, the, the capital that we make to make impact locally um, and be able to demonstrate to others that it is possible is one of the solutions that will help uh, make uh, progress at a larger scale. So did we answer your question? No. <laughs> 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 I, I had a few I think the answers were as good as, as anybody could possibly give you, but 
Oh, I, do we have, Bill, do we have time for one more question? One, one more question. Right, so this is an obvious point. Uh, the energy transition, as well as meeting today's energy needs, will require deployment of trillions of dollars of capital. And, you know, one observation I want to make is around the uh, sort of normalization of thematic and labeled uh, financial instruments, right? I'm talking about green bonds, transition bonds, sustainable bonds. Uh, we've hit about $3 trillion in global issuances cumulatively in the first half of this year. Of that, $2 trillion in green bonds. And I'm thinking we have all these use cases here in Houston where we could uh, deploy these kinds of instruments uh, and we don't have a single green bond issuance in all of Houston. Uh, just would be curious to, to hear if there's a level of interest from the oil majors to, to bankers in this town. Thank you. It's, it's been a very interesting development, still still bit in its uh, infancy. Uh, despite the large numbers you're talking about, I think right now it, it's, it's in many ways a matter of figuring out uh, what types of structures people want to be looking at for making these loans. And you've got a couple different flavors. You've got green bonds where you're putting the proceeds to work on a clean energy opportunity. You have sustainability linked bonds is another example where people are trying to improve their metrics. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm not sure that there is an arbitrage, so to speak. So like, I'm not sure that uh, if you're a clean energy company, you're necessarily able to borrow at a materially cheaper interest rate with the green bonds. Uh, however, there's a lot of interest in putting money into those types of instruments. Uh, it's, it's a topic of conversation with us a lot. It's tougher with the traditional, green, with the traditional energy companies. Uh, depends on the company and, and what, what their uses of the proceeds are. Uh, certainly there are other sectors where it's relevant to. Uh, I, I didn't realize that no Houston companies utilize those. There's certainly a lot of companies here in town that are looking at it. Uh, and again, it's still, it's still burgeoning. I, I would keep, keep your eyes open. There'll be more activity in that space with local companies. Uh, but, but to be defined what that market ends up looking like and, and uh, who ends up utilizing it and investing in it, I think. Dean, it seems like this might be up your alley. In terms of green bonds versus, yeah, it's one specific mechanism. We're going to have to find a way to have broader capital availability across all energy forms. And right now, you can't grease it enough, I guess. And the thing that's sort of the elephant in the room is to go into a lot of the new energy transition forms requires a leap of faith in more reliance on public support mechanisms than much of the industry has historically been willing to accept. Right. Even, even as they've started low carbon businesses, you will find many companies in the industry that are reticent to do that. So unless and until it appears to be profitable, that, that that's an issue. And if we go to the academic literature now on diffusion of technology and start talking you know, over decades now, of, as technologies are proven, this can't all be, we're just gonna take solar panels and wind turbines from China and replicate them around the world, right? That's not gonna solve it. You're gonna have to have value chains. You're gonna have to address mining and minerals and recycling and all these things in a cost-effective way. And the funding to make that happen amid a time when we also have an emerging debt crisis, amid a time that monetary systems are evolving and we're going to a digital currency, central bank backed, albeit, you know, th these, these are like tectonic plates shifting it around at a time that a big new capital need is being forced onto energy. So I think ultimately it's gonna take multilaterals thinking about how to really fund an energy transition in a way that doesn't exist today and it can't just be public support me mechanisms. It's going to have to be a government role that plays into this. That's not API calling for that. It's just me thinking as an economist. But there, there is an elephant in the room of something that is not going to get funded today that's going to need to be continue to be funded to meet global demand on an ongoing basis here. Um, hard, hard for me to to speak broadly, uh, what I would just reinforce is Shell and our investment. One third of the capital investment from our company comes to this country. And as I shared earlier, it is not for new frontier explor exploration. It is to support the growth of, yes, existing uh, oil and gas, but a huge amount of the capital is going all towards renewables. Um, that's where we are. Thank you. I'm sorry we can't go on. It's 
a fantastic and insightful panel. Can we have a hand for them, please? Thank you. But, you know, I appreciate your taking time out of your evening to join us here. And the last comment I'll make about depoliticizing energy, um, you know, OEP certainly doesn't have any um, golden solutions to that, but we do think that bringing together people from all corners of the sector who are well-intentioned and open-minded and dedicated to all of the above solutions is at least one part of that process. So we will do our bit to try to achieve that. Um, I really want to thank everyone for being part of this tonight. This was, as I said, our, our first as an organization live event here in Houston. This is certainly not our last um, time in Houston, notwithstanding tornado warnings and fire alarms, which uh, we will hope to do without the next time we're here. But we look forward to working with all of you in this room because from our perspective, it really is all about bringing people together and doing that to find innovation, find consensus, find points of differentiation that we then need to work on. So please take advantage of our programs, our webinars. Um, if you're in a city where we're having a live event, we look forward to having you join us. Please tell everyone you know about the Our Energy Library. Take those cards with you because that's a program that we're finding more and more is making a real difference. So thanks again. Travel safely. And we wish you all well. <laughs>